Hi, my name is Jason and I'll be giving a presentation on distributed consensus and its applications in the DevOps world. I titled the presentation An SRE's Guide to Distributed Consensus. Spoiler alert, there is no mention of the number 42. <laughs> okay, let's get started. I'll begin by defining what consensus means. Consensus is where is when a group of individuals come to an agreement or a general agreement. A general agreement implies that not all individuals in the group need to agree with the decision as long as most of the individuals have, have agreed. Then we can assume that a general consensus was achieved. There are several uh, applications for consensus in computing. As an example, if you have several workers that can process queued tasks, the workers will need to reach consensus on which of them should process a task in, in the queue to prevent a situation where more than one worker processes the same task. This can be achieved uh, by assigning a lock to each task on the queue. The workers then agree on which, which on whichever worker acquires a task's lock first will uh, be responsible for processing that task. Consensus in synchronized systems, like the one I have just uh, mentioned, is more often than not a trivial problem and can be achieved using locks, uh, also called mutexes and semaphores. Right. However, Consensus in distributed systems is a non-trivial problem due to the nature of distributed systems. Distributed systems are generally assumed to contain independent components, which I'll call nodes, that are connected to each other of our network. It is expected that both the nodes, node the nodes and the network connecting the nodes are, are prone to failure. Uh, the big consensus problem in distributed systems then is how to achieve consensus when some of the nodes that are expected to agree on something aren't all reachable at the same time, but are likely to be reachable at some point in time. Because consensus in distributed systems is not a trivial problem to solve, several algorithms have been created to tackle it. Most of these algorithms assume that the nodes in a distributed system may fail temporarily or permanently. They also assume that the network connecting the nodes can have varying latencies and there is a possibility of, a, of, of network partitions. Uh, with the network partition uh, being where different sections in a network are unable to reach each other for some time. The algorithms also assume that um, the nodes in a distributed system might have varying computing power and varying system clocks. You, for example, can have two nodes, A and B, in a distributed system, where A is a beefy server and B is a not so beefy laptop. A system clock might be synchronized with an NTP server and B's system clock might not be synchronized at all and therefore is likely not to be accurate. Right. What example distributed consensus algorithms exist? You may ask. Before I answer this question, I'll tell a short story uh, that hopefully will explain a bit why the distributed consensus landscape is what it is today. Here goes the story. In 1984, uh, Leslie Lampo, some of us might know him as the initial developer of LaTeX in a paper titled Using Time Instead of Timeout for Fault Tolerant Distributed Systems, defined an approach of solving the distributed consensus problem, which he called the state machine replication approach. In the next slide, I'll try to expound a bit more on what state machine, um, what state machines are and what state machine replication entails. Let me first finish the, the, the short story. Okay, in 1989, Lampo came up with the Paxos protocol for distributed consensus. 
Paxos relies on the state machine replication approach he had presented in 1984. It turns out that several of the most popular distributed consensus algorithms today fall under the Paxos family and maintain some aspects of the original protocol. It's also important for me to say that several other protocol, also other popular non-Paxos distributed consensus algorithms also follow the state machine replication approach. Um, approach. Fun fact, Paxos is named after the Greek island, Paxos. This isn't random, really. Lampo, in his paper uh, in 1984, explained the state machine replication approach using an analogy of Titius Parliament on the island of Paxos that had to function even though legislators continually wandered in and out of uh, the parliament chamber. The picture on this slide is one of the island of Paxos. Looks nice, right? Right. So, what is a state machine? A state machine is something which, when fed a command, changes from one discrete state to another. A good example of a state machine is a database, which, if you feed a query, might change from one state to another. If you, for instance, run an insert query against a database, the database will change from a state where it didn't have the data, it started, it started using the query, to a state where it has this data. In this example, the database is the state machine and the insert query is a command that changes the database from one state to another. And then another example of a state machine is a video game. When you feed a video game commands through an input device, let's say a gamepad, the video game changes from a state where, for instance, a, char a character is standing to a state where the character is seated. A simpler example of a state machine is a light bulb. When you flip the light bulb switch up, the bulb transitions from a state where it was off to a state where it is on. When you flip the switch down, the light bulb transition from, transitions from a state where it was on to a state where it is off. The act of flipping the switch up or down is a command in this example, and the light bulb whose state is affected by commands applied on it is a state machine. The image on this slide is what is called a state machine diagram. Um, and this is a state machine diagram for a light bulb. It's used to show the different discrete states of a, st a state machine as circles. The directional lines connecting the circles represent the commands that transition the state machine from one discrete state to another. An important characteristic of state machines is if you feed the machine a sequence of commands, it will always end up in the same state if the number of or if the number and the order of commands is maintained. State machine replication involves sharing commands intended to be applied to state machines in a manner that preserves the number and the order of, of, of these commands. The assumption is that if, for instance, commands are shared amongst 10 individuals, each possessing the same kind of state machine, after each of the individuals has applied their shared commands on their state machines, all the state machines will be in the exact same state. In the state machine replication approach, consensus is achieved when a majority of the nodes agree on the commands to apply against the individual state machines and what order these commands should be applied. Right, I have touched on some of the principles behind distributed consensus algorithms. I have also mentioned that Paxos is one of the popular distributed consensus algorithms. I am now going to narrow down on one distributed consensus algorithm and talk about how it works. It will not be Paxos though. The algorithm I'm going to talk about is Raft. Raft, just like Paxos, is one of the more popular distributed consensus algorithms. 
It is, however, considered easier to understand than Paxos. Several popular distributed data, data stores included Consul by HashiCorp and etcd, which is a default storage layer in Kubernetes clusters, use Raft for distributed consensus. Most recently, Apache Kafka switched from Zookeeper to internal code that uses Raft for consensus. The diagram on this, on this slide illustrates the architecture of a distributed system using Raft. It's a client server architecture uh, with clients sending commands to servers. The servers are technically the distributed systems nodes. Each of the servers contains uh, the consensus module, which is just the code implementing the Raft algorithm. Each of the servers also contains a log, which is just an ordered list of commands as they are received from the clients. And each of the servers has a state machine. Commands in the logs in the log are applied against the state machine in the order they appear. Okay, if this was a distributed uh, data uh, Postgres database, the commands sent uh, from clients would be the SQL queries. The state machines would be Postgres databases. Um, these queries are run against. Each of the nodes would have its own independent Postgres database. Each of the nodes would also have its own independent log, which is where the SQL queries are stored before they are run against the Postgres database. Notice from the diagram that Raft follows Lamport's state machine replication approach. So, how does Raft work? The Raft algorithm is broken down into three parts. The first part is leader election, where the node in the nodes in a cluster elect one of them to be their leader. The second part is log replication, which handles how commands are gotten from the clients sent to the nodes in the distributed system, and finally safely applied to the nodes state machines. The third part called safety deals with how to handle certain edge cases during leader election and log replication. Don't worry, the role of the leader in Raft will become clear when I explain how log, log replication works. For the purposes of this presentation, I will only focus on a bit of how leader election and log replication work in Raft. I will, however, not cover anything on safety. I highly encourage you to visit the link on this slide for a visual um, explanation of how Raft handles lead election, log replication, and safety. Okay, let's talk about leader election. Well, before going to, through the visualization on this slide, I'll try and explain how leader election works. In, in one of the previous slides, I explained the architecture of a distributed system in Raft, where each of the nodes is expected to have a log and a state machine. Apart from each node uh, having a log and a state machine, they also have an integer counter called a term. This counter is what is used to distinguish a past leader uh, from a current leader. Each of the nodes have the initial value of their term set to one. Nodes in the cluster can be in one of three states at any particular time. They can either be a leader, a candidate, or a follower. When a node joins a cluster, it joins as a follower. The first thing it does is start a countdown called an election timeout, which lasts an arbitrary number of milliseconds. Each node controls how long its election timeout should last. If the election timeout expires before the leader of, of the cluster sends a message to it, the node starts an election. To start an election, a node changes its, uh, um, its state to candidate. It then increments its term by one, votes for itself, then sends out a request to all the nodes in the cluster asking for their nodes. 
when a node receives an election request from a candidate in the cluster, it evaluates whether it should vote for the candidate. One of the conditions it checks is whether the candidate's term is greater than its own. It will only vote for the candidate if this is true. If all conditions are met, the node changes its term to that of the candidate, then sends its vote back to the candidate. When a candidate receives a vote from, from a node, it evaluates whether the total number of votes it has gotten so far in, in the current term is 50% of all the nodes plus one. If so, it sends out a request to all the nodes, including those that didn't vote for it, uh, indicating that it has now, that it is now the leader of the town. Even after a leader is gotten or discovered, every follower and candidate continues to run the election time. -out. They reset the time -out whenever they receive a message from the leader. This is done so that a node can be uh, can be able to discover when the leader is unavailable so that it can start a new election to become the new leader. I'm going to try and illustrate further how leader election works using the visualization on this slide. Right. Uh, I want us to focus on the visualization and ignore the table on the right side of the visualization. Uh, I'm going to focus mainly on the left side, so the circles and uh, uh, below. Um, this visualization tries to um, uh, tries to um, show how data election works with the circles um, in this um, in the visualization representing each node. So um, you have uh, a circle for the nodes are named S1, S2, S3, S4, and S5. Um, each of these uh, nodes at this particular time are in um, have an election timeout running, and the election timeout is represented by the green highlight around the uh, orange circle. Uh, you'll notice that when I start playing the visualization, the, the, the green circle or the green highlight will reduce to indicate that the timeout is uh, uh, kind of, a time, is kind of um, ticking. And uh, the, the number on each of the um, in on each of the nodes in the middle of each of the nodes indicates the current term for the node. So you notice that all the nodes are uh, are in term one. So I'm going to start the visualization. All right. Notice the election timeouts are uh, kind of um, ticking. And then something rapid will start happening. Okay, right. Okay, so let me rewind. Um, right, so what happened? So as the uh, as time goes um, and the election timeouts in each of the nodes uh, continue ticking, um, you will notice that the election timeouts are uh, kind of not the same, right? So each of the nodes has um, it's time out in uh, um, bound to expire at different times. And you will notice that um, at this particular point, the time out for S4 expires first, the election time out. So the first thing it does is um, it change, changes its state to candidate, um, hence the color change, and then it votes for itself. So the black dot uh, in the middle of uh, the, um, um, sorry, the black, the black dot highlight there on, on S4 indicates that it has voted for itself. And also notice that it has also, also incremented its term by one, meaning that its term is now at term 20. Um, so after that is done, it sends out a vote request to all the nodes. Um, the vote requests are the green dots um, approaching each of the nodes and once each of the nodes um, receives the, the vote request 
you will notice that um, let's say for S3, it will increase if it seems like it wants to it it has accepted uh, to vote for S4. It has incremented its term to term two, and it has sent back so the the response back from S3 is like a is a circle with a plus on it indicating that it has voted for it. Um, and you will you will notice that this is the same case for S5, S1, and S2. They will they also have accepted the vote request from S4. And as the vote responses are uh, the positive vote responses are approaching S4, you will notice uh, what happens in terms of um, as soon as as soon as it receives a majority of the of of the responses indicating that the other nodes in the cluster have accepted it as a leader, it will send back a second um, request indicating to all the nodes on the cluster that it is now the leader. And at, at this particular point, you will notice that all the nodes have have are now in term two. S4 is the new leader. It's uh it's highlight it's highlighted um it's a, it has a black highlight um again um, around it and you will no also notice that the other nodes in the cluster have uh the election timeouts still run um so the election timeouts will continue to run until uh until when um they either receive um a message from the leader or the timeout expires so that they can start a new election. But you notice the leader keeps on sending some um, requests, which we'll talk about in the next slide. Uh, and uh, the, the nodes keep on resetting their election timeouts, so their timeouts never expire for them to start the election. So that that is leader election in, in draft. Right. Raft caters for not only the happy path, but also edge cases that might occur in data election. The, the diagram on this slide shows the three node states and what uh, makes a node transition from one of the states to another. Uh, the happy path is that a node will start as a follower, its election timeout would expire, it will then change its state, state to candidate, then once it has received a majority of the votes, it changes its stage to a leader. However, for instance, a candidate does not, um, if a candidate doesn't receive a majority of the votes before its election timeout expires again, it starts, it restarts the election, right? So this is uh, indicated by um, this particular loop. Another edge case is when a node thinks it's the leader, then receives a message from a leader with a higher term. In that case, it changes its state back to a follower, but uh, with the term uh, for the actual leader. So uh, this, is, uh, uh, um, this is indicated by this particular transition. I will now explain how log replication in draft works. Log replication handles how commands are gotten from the clients, sent to the nodes in the distributed system, and finally, safely applied on their state machines. It is first important to note that uh, the leader is the only node allowed to receive commands from clients. This means that either the clients should be aware which node is the current leader, so that they can directly send the commands to that leader. Or some mechanism should be built uh, where if any of the followers receives a command from a client, they proxy this command to the leader. When a command is received by the leader, the leader will first append the command into its log. The leader will then forward the command to all the other nodes in the cluster. It uh, it does this using uh, what is called an append entries request. 
the append entities request contains, apart from just the command, the leader's current term and metadata of the command in the leader's log that appears right before the command that is in the current request. Uh, the metadata, um, this metadata um, for the previous log entry includes the index of the command in the log and the term the command was received. When a follower receives an append entries request from the leader, it first checks whether it's safe to append the command in the log, uh, in the request into its, 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 its own log. Two of the checks done are whether the follower's term is the same as the leader's term. And using the metadata in the append entries request, whether what the leader indicated as the command saved um, in its log right before the command in the request also exists in the follower's log, but as the last entry. Uh, if the follower is able to insert the command to its log, it does so then sends back a response to the leader indicating that it has inserted the command in the log. When the leader receives back a majority, positive responses from followers indicating the command was successfully inserted into the log, it applies the command into its state machine, marks the command as committed in the log, in its log, then sends back uh, the state machine's output to the client. The next append entries request the leader will send to the followers will indicate that it has applied the command its log into its, into its state machine. And it is only then that the followers will also apply the command into their state machines. Raf uses this approach of first confirming that a majority of the nodes have a command in their log before applying the command in the state machine so that there is a general consensus of what the cluster expects the state machine, state machines to look like at any particular time. This is a good this is this is a good strategy because if the leader were to go down to become an, uh, available in other terms, you would want a majority of the of the rest of the nodes to know what the leader had likely applied into its state machine. Note that the leader uh, will send an append entry request that doesn't have any uh, command to the followers as a form of of a heartbeat to assure the followers that it is, it is still alive. It does this uh, whenever the distributed system hasn't received any commands from, from clients within a period of time. Uh, this time period is normally set to less than uh, what is expected to be the uh, minimum election timeout uh, in nodes. Raft does this to prevent followers from starting an election because they didn't receive any message from the leader before the election timeout expires. And this is what we noted or this is what we observed in the um, visualization showing um, leader election where after the election was done and the leader was, was um, gotten, the leader continues to send uh, kind of requests to all the follower all the followers that's that that was a heartbeat and that that request to sending was technically a blank append entries request uh, which was used as a heartbeat uh, i will now illustrate how replication works uh, using the visualization visualization on this slide right um so let's focus on the present on the visualization of the slide um, again, the, um, we have the left side indicating the nodes in our cluster. So we have S1, S2, S3, S4, and S5 as the nodes. Um, each of the nodes are in um, have their current term set to 2. And uh, S4 is the current leader uh, because we have it uh, highlighted in black. Um, the again and the the green highlight on the other nodes um, is the election timeout on each of the of of the other nodes um, as discussed in the last visualization um, 
uh, that looked similar to this. Uh, but I will also touch on the, you know, the right side. The right side is um, shows the um, the log on each of the nodes. So this is the log on the node S1. This is a log on S2, log on S3, log on S4, and log on S5. Um, you will notice that uh, um, there seems to be uh, a S4 S4's log seems to be different. Um, um, and this is because I have just right now inserted uh, a command from a client to S4, which is the leader, uh, right? So we are going to see how the leader will replicate this uh, uh, command, which is currently in its own log, to the other nodes in the cluster. The uh, command in, inside the log um, is represented as a, a, like a square, a highlighted square. Uh, right now, the highlight is a dotted, a dotted highlight, and two indicates the, um, the term which the log was received. Um, and of course, the numbers up top here indicates the index of the log entry of the command in the log. So right now, this log that was, has just been inserted in S4, was received on in term two and has the index one within um, the log um, in S4. Uh, so let's see what happens. Right. All right. I'll uh, pause there and then I um, I'll rewind a bit. So Okay, so the first thing that after the leader S4 um, has received a command uh, from a client is that it appends the log, uh, it appends the command into its own log, then sends an append entries request to all the nodes. So this, the orange circle approaching S5, S1, S2, and S3 is the append entries request from um, the leader S4. Uh, uh, and this append entries request will contain uh, the command um, with index one in uh, S4. Once each of the uh, each of the nodes receives this append entries request, they will of course check whether this it is safe to insert um, this log entry. Um, it's, it's safe to insert this command into their log. So I'm going to use command and log entry inter interchangeably here. So it will check whether it is safe to insert this log entry. And if it's so, it would insert it. And uh, you will notice, so S3 has received the, the log entry first, um, the append entries request first. It has appended the log entry into its own log and is now in the process of sending back a positive confirmation to S4. Uh, you will notice uh, S2 has done that also, S1 will do that, and S5 has done that. Then upon, um, upon S4 receiving a majority confirmation from the nodes, majority meaning uh, once uh, three out of the five nodes have confirmed that the um, command is in their logs in the right position, S4, you will notice, will um, will will mark, will commit the log entry, and by committing, you will you will notice that the highlight will change on on its logs. So observe that. So, um, oh, sorry, right. So, the once it has received a positive a majority positive response from the nodes. And again, majority is three out of five. It doesn't need to receive all five confirmations um, for it to uh, um, commit the, the log entry. And in at this particular point, it has committed the log entry um, or the command into its, into its date machine. So if this was a Postgres uh, database, at this particular point, it means that S4's Postgres database 
would have whatever um, change the um, SQL command um, had in it. So if it was an insert query, the at this particular point, s Postgres database would have that particular insert command affecting uh, or affected um, its, its uh, Postgres database. But the other nodes in the cluster wouldn't necessarily have their Postgres uh, commands, their Postgres state machines um, with with the with the um, it's at query applied on them. They are still waiting on the leader to confirm that it has applied uh, the, the 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 command in the state machine. So yes, so the the leader S four has has applied, and um, in this state as case, you see um, the highlight has changed again. But these other um, the followers are still waiting on a confirmation from from the leader. So the next append entries request the leader sends uh, has the indication, will have the indication uh, that S4 has inserted, um, has, a, has inserted command in index, uh, in index one within its log, uh, in its state machine. Uh, it has applied, the, it has committed that uh, log entry into its um, state machine. And the correct term there is committing of, of, of the command. And uh, once that is done, you will notice that once the, um, the followers have received, uh, so who will receive it first? So S2 has received the, the append entries um, request first, and it has applied, um, or it has committed um, index one in its log into its state machine. S1 has also done that. S3 has done that and S5 has done that. And then they send back a positive uh, response back to the leader, S4. So let's let's look at, uh, let's observe what happens then when we insert a second, um, when we issue a second command from uh, a client to S4. So at this particular point, I have issued a second command S4 has, has inserted that second command into its um, into its log as index number two. Uh, then it will go on and send the append entries request to all the nodes. The nodes will um, con check, check whether the uh, it is safe to insert um, index number two into the its uh, into their into their logs, and again the the safety check that is done um, by the followers includes whatever append entries request um, S four sends at this particular point will indicate that okay yes you are going to be inserting command said command into index two uh, sorry you are going to be inserting said command however uh, I also have another command, the last command I have in my log prior to this new command that I am sending is in index one of my log and it was received when in term two. So at this point, when the checks are being done, the, the, each of the followers before inserting this second uh, command into their log would first check the, the metadata indicating the previous uh, command in uh, in the leader's log, and in this case, the previous log is uh, the the previous command is index one. So if and it seems all of them have index one, uh, and it is only then that they append the second command to their log. Again, the leader will wait for a positive confirmation from a majority of the followers indicating that they have appended the command into their log before it commits that log, before it commits that command into its state machine. And in this case, you've seen at this particular point, it has um, it has received a positive uh, confirmation from the majority of them and it commits it, um, it, it has committed the second command to its state machine. And uh, the next uh, 
uh, the next append entries uh, the next append entries uh, response that the that the that the leader will send back to the followers will tell the the followers to also commit that uh, command into the state machine and that is basically how uh, log replication works in uh, raft all right i'll pause right now and recap on what we've discussed so far so uh, we've kind of discussed on kind of touched on what consensus is uh, in computing how um, consensus in distributed systems is not a trivial problem uh, to solve um, hence why we've um, there's several distributed consensus algorithms that have been um, kind of uh, formulated to solve the distributed consensus problem how most of um, these um, distributed consensus algorithms use the replicated state machine uh, method of, of solving distributed consensus. Uh, we've touched on uh, a bit on um, Paxos as being one example of such kind of uh, distributed consensus algorithm. And we've also uh, kind of uh, um, touched on Raft as being another example of a distributed consensus algorithm that uses the replicated state machine approach to handle distributed consensus. Uh, we've also seen um, how leader election and uh, log replication works in uh, Raft. All right, so now I'll, um, I'll kind of take time to describe how, um, now that we kind of have a bit of understanding of how um, Raft works, how, like, I'd, I'd give a DevOps scenario that we can use um, distributed uh, consensus um, to solve the problem. Right, and this is a very uh, typical scenario. Um, well, the um, first, before kind of talking about the DevOps scenario, I'll uh, I'll, I'll mention that distributed consensus isn't necessarily only applicable in the more obvious um, stuff like distributed storage, right? So um, thinking about how Consul and uh, etcd uses, um, the, how they use um, Raft, there are other ap applications for distributed consensus um, within the DevOps world. Um, so and I'll give a scenario. So let's say you, know, you need to manage the, de the deployment of software updates to your infrastructure. Some of the requirements that you need to consider include, uh, one, the software updates might be large, in some cases, larger than one gigabyte. Two, the software updates will be regular. So think about uh, you having tens to hundreds of software updates per day. Three, the software updates should be uh, deployed to the entire infrastructure quickly. So in tens of minutes or up to an hour, your, your software update should be rolled out to your infrastructure. And four, the software updates should be done in a way that doesn't cause service interruption. So this is very typical of um, uh, software expectations of software updates um, in the current DevOps world. So um, let's say you initially go with the approach where uh, when a software update is published in your infrastructure, in your artifacts repository, so you, let's say you have an artifacts repository and an update is published to the repository and an automated pipeline kicks in and begins the process of deploying the software update to your servers. Uh, the deployment pipeline currently is targeting tens of servers spread across a few availability zones within the same geographic region. Uh, the deployment uh, pipeline rolls an update to the servers by applying the update uh, to a small chunk of the servers at a time. So it rolls the update. 
it takes tens of minutes to roll it uh, to the entire infrastructure. There is no issue with each of the servers downloading the software updates from the centralized artifacts repository. Everything seems uh, fine and dandy. However, over time, your business grows and so does the need to have more servers in your fleet. You scale up your infrastructure to, hun uh, to hundreds of servers spread out, spread out across different availability zones in different geographical ge ge geographic regions. Some cracks in your deployment process we're going to show. You notice that the artifacts repository in your, uh, is your biggest bottleneck. The repository is upload link. Um, the upload link speed limits how fast the software update can be served to servers uh, at the same time. And the expectation here is that you'll have um, um, tens of servers trying to download the update uh, at the same time, tens to hundreds of servers at the same time. You also notice that software updates uh, take longer to download in availability zones that are geographically further from the region um, your artifacts repository is deployed in. Another thing you notice is that since your availability uh, zones now have more servers in them than before, the, up, the downlinks in those availability zones become congested whenever the deployment pipeline kicks in uh, because you have more servers in the same availability zone trying to download the software update at, at the same time. Servers deployed in your infrastructure, ex, sorry, services deployed in your infrastructure uh, begin to experience reliability issues whenever a large software update is rolling because they aren't able to fetch data from clients fast enough. So, um, you decide to scale up your software release architecture. The updated architecture includes a CDN node running in each of the regions your infrastructure is deployed in. Uh, when a software update is being rolled out to your infrastructure, the servers now download the software update from the CDN node closest to them. The approach definitely works uh, better. The downlinks in your availability zone zones, however, still get uh, uh, congested whenever a large software update is being deployed just because you have you still have a large number of servers trying to download a software update uh, at the same time from the same availability zone um, you scale out your fleet to thousands of servers um, business is growing uh, your software update process also starts becoming more complicated for instance uh, because now you now you have to uh, deal with far more advanced adversaries you make it a requirement that a software updates cryptographic signature has to be verified before uh, a software update is applied to a server. Also, since your fleet is now uh, composed of different kinds of servers, let's say Intel and AMD servers, you have to uh, confirm that uh, an update was successfully deployed uh, and is running okay for each of the kinds of servers you have deployed. Uh, you notice that it is harder to coordinate the deployment process um, centrally from your continuous delivery tool, especially in cases where a deployment check has failed for a subset of your infrastructure, and all you need to do is roll back to a previous release for just the affected subset of uh, servers. It's harder because your centralized uh, continuous delivery tool Need to get a status update from each of the thousands of servers as a deployment uh, as a deployment is running. The CD tool also has to figure out which servers to roll back if a, a certain check fails on, on a server. For example, if the pre-flight checks uh, pass on your uh, first targeted uh, Intel server but fails on your first targeted AMD server, is it safe? To assume it well, it is safe to assume that uh, it will fail on the other AMD servers. So um, roll back the release on just the AMD servers, but continue the deployment of the, the dead servers. It is just one of the um, uh, 
whatever I've described here is just one of the permutations um, you have to deal with the several others, as you might uh, imagine. So it seems like you, you still have some uh, problems with, uh, with scale. Your um, availability zones still get uh, congested. Their downgrades um, get, get, get congested um, when large software updates are being uh, deployed. And um, your central point of failure has shifted um, from your um, from what was your artifacts repository to your continuous delivery tool. So how can you use distributed consensus at this particular point to scale your deployment process further to handle these thousands of servers? Right, here's how I do it. Um, add, um, I divide the, the servers into homogeneous groups. Uh, for instance, if the main distinguishing characteristic for servers in my fleet are uh, the processor, processor architect, architecture and the availability zone, then I'd have a group for each uh, architecture in each availability zone. That'd be therefore uh, one group consisting consisting of only Intel servers in availability zone A, another group for AMD servers in availability zone A. There would uh, be a third group for Intel servers running in availability zone B, and a fourth group um, for AMD servers in availability zone B, and uh, so on and so forth. Each of these groups would coordinate the deployment process independently. And for the group uh, coordination to be reliable, I'd use a distributed consensus algorithm like Raft. And in, on, in order for me to use a distributed consensus algorithm like Raft to coordinate the software deployment process, I will need to re represent the process as a state machine. Right. It turns out representing the software deployment process as a state machine isn't too hard. Uh, the state machine diagram on this slide shows a hypothetical complex deployment process that involves cryptographic um, verification of an update, then rolling the update to a tenth of uh, the servers in a group of, uh, at a time, and running pre-flight checks after the update is applied. Uh, so, if any of the uh, of the steps failed, fail, sorry, the group begins the process of rolling back to the previous software release. Um, now, now that the deployment process is represented as a state machine, how do you, how does the coordination actually work um, using Raft? Um, we'd have a software coordination service running on all the servers. The servers would. Uh, 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 the servers in a group would elect a leader. The, the servers would also act as both um, clients and uh, servers in the group. Um, so you, um, let me go back uh, a few slides to kind of uh, illustrate that. So what I'm trying to say here is that the servers in the group will act both as uh, clients. So they'll be the ones issuing the commands um, going into the consensus module and the servers um, within the uh, raft architecture, right? So uh, a bit of uh, repetition there, but I uh, uh, hope uh, you kind of understand um, that. So the, the servers would act both as, uh, uh, as, a, as a clients and the servers in the distributed system. Um, the leader, once elected, would be responsible for checking for software updates. When an update becomes available, it sends a command to the group of servers requesting uh, for the state machine to change uh, to the group marked as running or release. So, uh, so for the group to kind of transition into uh, this first uh, state. So the, the leader will send the uh, first command that will tra transition the state machine into this state. Right, so um, 
uh, uh, once there is a consensus uh, from a majority of the uh, servers in the group that uh, the group can uh, the, the state machine can transition into uh, into the group marked as uh, running old release state um, the leader would go ahead and commit to this state by updating um, um, the uh, like an infrastructure registry uh, indicating that the group this particular group of homogeneous servers is running an old outdated version of, of the software um, the leader would then issue another command transition from the group marked as running already state to the new release downloaded in data state once there is a consensus from majority of, from a majority of the servers that the group can transition to this state the leader would commit again to this uh, by downloading the software update from the closest CDN node right um, at this point the leader would cryptographically check whether the software update is valid and if so would issue another command to the group requesting that the group transition to the new release downloaded uh, to the first one tenth of the server state yeah and when a consensus is reached uh, the leader would proceed to commit uh, to this state by selecting the first one tenth of the servers uh, that the release should roll to then requesting them to download the update. Uh, and then we'll be downloading the update from the leader and not from the CDN node uh, because the version in the leader is technically what is verified. Uh, once the selected one tenth of servers uh, all have confirmed that they have the software update downloaded, the leader would issue a command requesting uh, the group to transition into the next state. Uh, this kind of coordination uh, will be done until a point where the group of servers is in the group running current release state, which is uh, what we want, or a rollback has been done and the group uh, is back uh, is back to the um, or sorry, a rollback is required and the group is marked as uh, running old uh, um, a release state. Um, and some form of intervention is needed for for the for the group to kind of transition into this new uh, release. So you will notice that um, with this approach, one um, the need for a central continuous delivery tool has been removed. Um, also, in an availability zone, uh, you don't have uh, congestion of the downlink during the process of downloading um, the, a software update from the CDN node, just because it is only leaders in, in groups within that availability zone uh, that are expected to download uh, the software updates from the um, CDN node. All the other, um, all the other servers um, in the infrastructure, which are all technically followers, will be downloading the software updates from their leaders. Right. So if ever the leader were to, be, uh, to go down, become available, unavailable, uh, there will be a graceful transition to another leader since a majority of servers are aware of the current state of the deployment process. The lead, new leader will uh, basically just pick up where the old leader left off. And there you have it. That's how it is distributed consensus to uh, solve the, uh, the deployment uh, process on the software in like a massively scaled out um, uh, fleet of servers. Right, hopefully I have uh, uh, pitched to you um, the how interesting distributed consensus is as a problem and um, its applications within the DevOps world. Um, Personally, um, whatever um, um, I have illustrated here, or the example I illustrated on using uh, distributed consensus to uh, for rolling software releases, I have it is all hypothetical right now. But what I'm working on right now is trying to scale out um, or to build a dis distributed SQLite database. Um, 
using um, Craft. And uh, you can find the code for that particular project um, on the, the link on this slide that's github.com forward slash json rockena forward slash light draft. Um, and um, I am done. Um, thank you for uh, taking your time to watch this uh, presentation.